A new power is rising. Its victory is at hand. Today we're going to look into what is coming in the next edition of Stellaris. That's right, the next patch 3.8 Gemini. Stellaris Dev Diary 291 and 292 are now out and we're going to do a deep dive into the new things we may be getting. We're looking at some reworks to diplomacy and the AI diplomatic interactions that could mean quite a change to the state of a galaxy in the mid to late game for our single player playthroughs. On top of that, it looks like Stellaris is going to be getting a feature straight from Victoria 3 and Crusader Kings 3. We've also had two hotfixes come out for Stellaris post first contact release and I'll be going through the patch notes for those two hotfixes to tell you what is actually going to be happening and how I think it will be affecting your game. Stick around for all of that and more as we dive in. Let's start with the big ticket items here and that is the diplomacy changes and other changes we're going to be seeing with patch 3.8. One of the developers, Alfre Strike, has finished his duties with the First Contact DLC and he's now transitioned back to the Custodian team. For those of you who don't know what the Custodian team is, in essence the Stellaris development team are split into two teams, the Custodian team and I think they're called the Crisis team. The Crisis team work on the DLC, that is the paid content we get and the custodians work on the free content we get with every patch, which is around every three months. It is thanks to the diligent work of the custodian team that we are getting a fresh and updated game and we're getting a dev team which is looking at game balance, game mechanics, UI interactions, a whole host of different areas that are helping to improve Stellaris years after it has first been released. Now Alfre is currently running a feedback thread looking for constructive directed feedback on AI diplomatic interactions. Why is that? Well Alfre is looking to have a bit of a rework when it comes to AI diplomacy, which I think sounds absolutely fantastic. Alfre has said, we are looking for feedback for the AI's willingness to accept diplomatic pacts, become subjects or overlords and form federations in particular when it comes to the interactions between other AI empires. Some of the changes for the 3.8 Gemini patch that they are considering is requiring a trust threshold for the AI to offer certain diplomatic agreements and improvements on the AI weights for diplomatic traditions. So let's break that down for a moment. First off, trust. Now, trust is a modifier that as you have certain agreements, be that a pact, a migration pact, non-aggression pact, defensive pact, that sort of thing, you will build up trust with that empire. If they're an AI empire, that will provide you with a relations bonus, a modifier, increasing relations between your two empires. That should then make it easier in future to get them to accept other pacts which may require slightly higher relationship status. For example, a defensive pact usually requires you have quite good relations, so you might first want to guarantee an AI empire or possibly form a non-aggression pact, that sort of thing. And then by keeping that pact going, you'll be building up trust and thus relationship every month. What Alfre here is proposing, however, is that we use this trust buildup as a threshold before which the AI will not be attempting to do certain things. For example, accepting diplomatic vassalization and becoming a subject. As it stands right now, I would say, and I think some of you might share this experience, that the AI empires agree to become vassals far too readily in Stellaris without actually going to war. This means you tend to see a galaxy filled with empires, though the power blocks and power groupings tend to be forming around the early to mid game as AI empires that are slightly ahead of others are making sure that their neighbors become their vassals through very easy and convenient diplomacy methods that require very little work. What I definitely like to see is much less of that. Now, I'm not saying it should never happen, 
But I think that having vassal relationships being forged mainly through conquest would make a lot of sense. It would slow down the speed at which the galaxy forms up into smaller and smaller power groupings as one large empire might start to take more and more vassals, thus carving out quite a large area of space for themselves without actually having to go through conquest. Now though, if they first have to trust, get this trust build up from other agreements with other AI empires, that will significantly slow down the progress of the AI because a lot of the time, AI empires will not form a commercial pact or a non-aggression pact with another empire, but they might be happy to become a vassal, which doesn't really make a lot of sense. I think this diplomacy change, having a trust threshold in order to offer certain diplomatic agreements could be very healthy for the game overall. The second part of this, improvements on the AI weights for diplomatic traditions, should mean, unless I'm mistaken, we are going to see the AI taking the diplomacy tradition more and thus forming federations more readily. You don't tend to see that many outside of possibly one or two federations forming in a game. Now in a small galaxy that's absolutely fine, but in a very large galaxy with say 20 AI empires, it would be nice to get multiple federation type power blocks forming rather than the current state of the game where we tend to see multiple vassal power blocks forming and not these uh, kind of united federation of planets equal power groupings that I would like to see arising in the game. We will have to see exactly what ends up happening with patch 3.8 but I believe Alpha is definitely moving in the right direction here, and I'm excited to see what he comes up with. For those of you that don't know, Alfrey was one of the largest forces behind the new rework to Ascensions, which gave us the new cybernetic Ascension and reworked that system around to, I think, the betterment of all. And if you're enjoying this video, please increase your trust modifier using that like button. The other big change that we have had teased so far for patch 3.8 is a system you may be familiar with if you've played the latest Crusader Kings or Victoria games. That is nested tooltips. I am very, very excited to be getting nested tooltips in Stellaris. I thought it was one of the best features from a UI perspective for Crusader Kings and Victoria respectively. Now, in Stellaris, it's not going to be called nested tooltips, it's going to be called concepts. As part of the devs' ongoing efforts to make the game less daunting for new and returning players, they've discovered a UX insight technology while observing the pre-FTL games made by their sibling studios. In 3.8, the devs will be introducing concepts as a variant of the nested tooltip you may be familiar with from Crusader Kings or Victoria. The primary goal with concepts is to simplify tooltips while providing the means to get more information than before. Instead of cluttering the base tooltip with complete details, you'll now be able to dig down to learn more about key terms as desired. While it may change for the final release, concepts are currently planned to always be shown in a specific teal color definitely not unlike the nested tooltips we see in Victoria or Crusader Kings. After a brief delay, or after clicking the middle mouse button, a tooltip that possesses inline concepts will lock into place as shown now. And what we're seeing here looks almost identical to the nested tooltips from those other games. This is going to mean that the initial tooltips we get are much, much smaller and if we want to find out more information about something, we can dive further into it. I imagine in the beginning, the scope of these concepts may be relatively limited, but I'm hopeful it's something that will be expanded upon by the custodian team in the future. The initial efforts of the devs in introducing these have been focused so far on galaxy settings before starting a new game to further explain some details that might not be obvious at first glance. But to fully explain would bloat the normal tooltip into a massive wall of text. These concepts in 3.8 will initially be limited exclusively to the galaxy settings, the devs are planning on expanding the use of concepts to Empire creation and beyond during the Custodian releases 
over this next year. I imagine the amount of time that they actually have to work on this as a custodian team is relatively limited, however, and that means I suspect that we probably only got one dev, possibly two, working on this part time. So it's something that will be added in uh, over time slowly, as they mentioned, and we might not even see full integration of this until next year maybe even until Stellaris 2, when I assume we'll definitely have it. Next week, in the Dev Diaries, we're going to start getting some of the main features that will be added in Gemini, and hopefully some details on the planned 3.8 Gemini Open Beta. Yes, you heard correctly, the devs are going to be giving us an open beta for the next patch of Stellaris, I believe this is riding on the heels of the success of the 3.6 open beta. Now, because we're getting an open beta, this may mean, and I believe it probably does, that we won't be getting a DLC with patch 3.8, which means for the first time in many, many years, we may not be getting a main DLC coming before the summer. Now, usually, Stellaris delivers a main content DLC around April or May. We have had in previous years Stellaris Overlord, Stellaris Nemesis, Stellaris Federations. You get the idea. We don't know what we're going to be getting this time, and it also looks like we won't be getting it on the same schedule as usual. We do, however, seem to have something of a clue for what may be coming with patch 3.8. We have an image of the game director's dog, Tofu, who appears to be poring over a medical textbook. What are they looking at in that textbook? Well, they're looking at internal organs. Internal. I think this could be a reference to patch 3.8 being a change to internal politics within our empires. Coincidence? I think not! That, or maybe we're getting some new xenophobe and purging mechanics, and this is all going to be about the biology of the aliens we find out there, and how best we can use them and apply our knowledge to that whole area. Uh, it could also be a reference possibly to the internal organs asset. Maybe this dog is doing a bit of espionage, but even then, that would be a meta reference in and of itself. Aside from my wild speculation based on this lovely image of a cute dog, however, what would you like to see in patch 3.8? What feature or mechanic would you most like to see reworked? Let me know down in the comments below. Personally, from my point of view, I'd like a full rework on the war goal and the war and peace system. The peace system in Stellaris, I believe, is getting quite a bit janky and does need a real thorough look at. I also promised at the start of this video I would briefly look at the patch notes for 3.7.3 and 3.7.4. It is now time to do that, ladies and gentlemen. So starting off with 3.7.4, which yes, is the most recent patch that actually came out today, this morning, but I think it has some of the most interesting changes in it. With the first post-release fix, they did promise us a solution to the nuclear crisis option. As of the release of Stellaris First Contact, when most civilizations got to the atomic age, they would generally be wiped out in the greatest of great filters. A monthly 5% chance that nuclear war breaks out. Or something along those lines, as far as I recall. Maybe it was a 5% chance of an event, and there was a 5% chance that event was nuclear war. Now that was an accumulated total chance of 0 0.0025 which doesn't sound like a lot, a 0.25% chance every month that your pre-FTL in the atomic age or beyond will go nuclear and kill themselves. However, I have done the maths and let me tell you it's much more scary than that. Now, the mean time to happen for this to fire, for one of your primitives to go the way of the dodo and just die would have been 276 months. That sounds like a reasonable amount. Well, that's only 23 years. Given how long it takes for a primitive to go from the atomic age to being an FTL empire, 
If the mean time for it to go nuclear and end itself is only 23 years, the Empire will almost never reach the FTL stage. And that is generally what people were seeing. Now the devs promised with 3.7.3 that they had fixed that, that they had removed this chance. However, they'd only done that on the unobserved empires. Once you put an observation post above an atomic age or greater empire, this chance started rolling all over again, which is why we were seeing lots and lots of nuclear fire and Armageddon on the lovely primitives we were trying to either uplift, steal from, or just observe. With patch 3.7.4, however, they have gone further to fix it. They have now increased the chance of having a close call when nuclear war threatens to break out. By increasing this modifier, they should vastly reduce the number of empires that die to nuclear war and thus increase the total number of primitives that survive this great filter and end up joining the galactic community. Whilst on the one hand, I thought it was really neat, very thematic, and probably quite realistic that a lot of these empires wiped themselves out in nuclear annihilation, I don't think it made for a fun gameplay experience, and it was really annoying when you accidentally increase the tech level on an empire, possibly to the atomic age, and then they would kill themselves. With the payback origin, if you defeat the debt collectors three times at present, the MSI will now humiliate you instead of trying to vassalize you, and that, I think, is somewhat better. However, I've really been enjoying playing Payback, and then I know by year 45, this is it. I am all out in my Payback war against MSI if I continue to refuse paying the debt collectors anything. I think this change makes sense from a balance and gameplay perspective. However, I was kind of used to and enjoying the way it was previously. Additionally, when you're actually at war with MSI, the debt collectors will stop bothering you. This was quite a bit of a headache. My fleets were away fighting MSI, fighting for our species, and then the debt collectors would show up even though I'm at war with MSI. I mean, they'd clearly get the message that I didn't want to pay, you would have thought. You also cannot vassalize or impose ideology on homicidal empires with payback, and they've slightly increased the surrender acceptance of payback war goals, which before now were excruciatingly high. You basically had to occupy every system and planet of MSI. Additionally, they fixed an issue where a payback empire using the end threat war goal against MSI could end with a whimper instead of as intended. I think they're referring to the fact that you would end up getting the event popping up that claimed MSI had been killed by another empire and then giving you a payback war goal on yourself rather than going for the full and proper ending. However, I'm not entirely sure exactly what they mean. Reactor power has had a buff of 15%. That is basically irrelevant to us because we don't get to design our star bases, which is really, really sad. Uh, but I think it's good because that means that we're going to be seeing star bases that actually have enough power to put weapons on them, which is going to be useful. Hive mines with both cordyceptic drones and stargazers, as predicted, now start with three reanimated amoebas. That means that stargazer cordyceptic is now stronger than ever before, and I'm totally here for that change. Additionally, we have had some real issues when playing First Contact with pre-FTL awareness. If you try to do the secret espionage action and increase awareness through the espionage action, it would decay roughly at a rate of one awareness per month back down to its resting value, meaning because of the time it takes to do the damn operation, you could never really, unless you've really specced into espionage, push a pre-FTL primitive race into understanding and becoming aware of the fact that there is more out there than just themselves without just clicking that reveal yourselves button, which does give a massive, massive negative modifier, which gets more negative, that is the stellar culture shock, the lower the awareness of the empire you contact. Or at least I believe it does. If it doesn't, let me know in the comments below and I've I've been very confused. I swear it does if it doesn't. I'm suddenly feeling a little unsure, but we'll leave it in. You can all hear how um, I'm a bit unsure. We'll find. What's this? A person on the internet doesn't claim to know everything? What a lie. Anyway, so the raise awareness espionage operation now prevents pre-FTL awareness from naturally decaying for five years. 
And additionally, it cannot naturally decay below 10. So if they become partially aware or whatever the, the, the 1 to 25 stage is, that will now be stuck at that level unless you do the espionage operation. The triumvirate ending for Fear of the Dark is now achievable from infiltrating the Favorian government. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay, that's pretty cool. So now you can set up an observation post and then if the event doesn't fire, if you're cloaked or something, perhaps then you can use the infiltrate government uh, option and then go down the triumvirate ending. Wow, that, that's a pretty cool change. I'm definitely there for that. There have been a few changes to MSI as well. Now, some of you, myself would be included in this, have complained that MSI is a bit weak some of the time. No longer. They have now got bonus naval capacity and additional starting technologies, making them scarier than a regular advanced AI empire. That's a weird sentence, but they are now going to be somewhere between an advanced empire and the imperial fief overlord origin empire. That should mean that MSI stick around for longer and are more of a big bad threat to you in the mid game than they ever have been previously. Now those are actually the main changes from the hot fixes and releases we've had in the last week or so after First Contact is out. I do want to mention just a couple of other bits and pieces that are really good additions. First, when an AI has the clone army origin, from now on it will create clone vats to keep its colonies alive, meaning it can actually expand its empire because it will build the clone vats. This improves the power of AI clone armies. We've also had a whole host of fixes to the Solarpunk Empire to do with their hyperlanes joining, not joining, things going a bit wrong, planets overlapping and the like. Overall, these hotfixes look like they are really, really pushing Stellaris in the right direction and it's great to see this game that I love still being worked on many, many years after release. If you've enjoyed this video and you've always been wondering what would happen if you never used any FTL in Stellaris, yes that's right, no exploration, no expansion, because of course you can't leave your system without FTL, then wander no further. I have attempted to complete a no FTL challenge in Stellaris. If you'd like to see that for yourself, click the video on screen now.